Hey, grab a spoon, a knife and fork. It's time for a taste of your Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Taste of York 2. This is a follow-up uh, to a show that we did in the early part of the pandemic that just sort of happened out of a conversation staff meeting. And um, we'll talk about that in a minute, but I want to introduce my co-host, Mr. Bill Castellino. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, Dennis. That was great. I love that little opening number. Terrific. Yes, that, that, uh, Dennis put that together for our first one, and he became the official music director for A Taste of York and a lot of other things that we're doing online during the pandemic, and he's been an irreplaceable part of it all. We're delighted to have him. Well, hats off to York. You guys are keeping us busy. The online presence is fantastic. It's wonderful. You get us off of Netflix and off the news. And we get to watch you guys in these various roundtables and panel discussions and archivals. It's really good. So thanks to the York and York staff for putting it together. And thanks to the York audience for showing up and keeping us going. Thank you. And also making contributions, which help keep these things happening. We love not charging for things. And so far, we've not actually charged for anything. Uh, we just ask for contributions and everyone has been wonderfully supportive, which helps make these things happen. So yeah, it's great. Uh, thanks to everyone who's done that and, and who might still. Um, as I mentioned, this uh, show tonight came out of a conversation that we had in staff meeting early on. Someone said, wouldn't it be neat if various friends from York got together and cooked something? And maybe they don't have to be, uh, gourmet cooks. Maybe they just love cooking or they have one favorite recipe that they love to share. And we give the audience recipes ahead of time and we intersperse some videos from York shows that have some connection to the to the to either the recipe or the person making the recipe. And it all just turned out wonderfully. People loved it. And the best thing is that now I see other theaters are doing similar things. So imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, as we know. Yes. And um, that's an example of it. But Bill, uh, you may or may not know, is a longtime friend of mine, but also of the company, has directed a number of shows for us over the years. Um, just uh, off the top of my head, Desperate Measures and Cagney among them. and. Um, he also happens to be a fabulous cook. So his segment in the first one was one of the standouts. He came off as someone who should have his own cooking show. And uh, so I asked him back to do this and he graciously agreed to really put it together and be the co-host with me. So delighted to have you, Bill. And um, tell us what we're gonna see tonight. Well, it's unbelievable. You guys, it is October. What, where has the time gone? And what do we do with the time, I guess, is a really other point. And I think part of what we're doing is we're not going to restaurants. Uh, we're home and we're cooking for ourselves mostly and for each other in our little pods, which is what we're supposed to do. So what I try to do is find theater folk who really love York and have worked with us at York and, and also are good home cooks. And you know what? There's quite a few of us out there because some of us theater people do our best work in the kitchen, just saying. So uh, I reached out to a bunch of people and was trying to find the people who were willing and available and might get into this kind of thing, sharing a recipe. Uh, they had to record it in their own home kitchen uh, with somebody in their pod on their smartphone. And uh, then we put it together. And what happened was pretty amazing. Uh, you'll see four recipes tonight. It turns out that as we were putting the menu together, that there are international recipes. We have a Puerto Rican recipe, an Italian recipe, a Greek recipe, a Mexican res uh, recipe. So, I mean, that was wonderful. And three of the four recipes, not the dessert, have um, seafood in them. And there's another connector in, these, in this, but which we can talk about all of that later. And then we also like pepper the pepper the program with a little um, archival. Jim, you want to tell us about that? Yeah, one of the things that worked wonderfully the first time is finding video clips from York productions 
that illustrate uh, or illuminate the moment, the recipe, the person making the recipe. And uh, we have that again tonight. And uh, there's no point in talking about them up front. You will see them as they come along. But they're wonderful connections to all of the people involved. And we look forward to sharing them with you. So Bill, maybe it's time to take it away. Yeah, let's get started with the starter. Say in the kitchen. Okie dokie. Well, okay. Here we are at our kitchen at Miller Place. I'm here with my camera crew and my spouse, Steve Abbey. Thank you, Steve. Say <laughs> and we're gonna start this tonight with a starter. It is a Tuscan white bean tuna dip. Uh, I got this recipe from Tony Miola, who's a really, really, really great home cook. My go-to phone call when I have a question about what to do about whatever's happening here. And also an astounding theater person. He is a great sound designer. You might have heard a play called Wicked or Lion King. That was for his shows. And he's a good pal. And he sent me this recipe. White bean. Okay, white beans starts with an onion. Now, one of the tips that Tony gave me is you can use either white, yellow, or red, and if I was a juggler, I'd juggle right now, onions. If you use the yellow or the red onion, you should cut it up first and soak it for an hour. That gets the bitterness out and brings out the sweet. But if you're gonna do what we're doing, you use the white onion. So we start with a white onion and our equipment is a food processor. You quarter the onion, you put it in the food processor. This makes a little bit of noise, but only for a second. Onions first. The next part is the bean part. Now you can use dried beans. If you choose to do that, you need to soak them overnight. Or you can use, I think, canned beans to the same effect. Uh, garbanzos are good, or cannellini beans are good. I prefer these, but it really doesn't matter. Both work in this dish. You drain the beans, rinse the beans, and you add them to the onions. Boom. And zhuzh. You want sort of a coarse consistency. Don't make it like peanut butter, make it chunkier than that. The next thing is the tuna. You also have choices here. You can go with canned tuna, which is perfectly okay, or you can go with this jarred Italian tuna, which I prefer for a dish like this. I think the uh, canned tuna works really good anytime you cook it, but I think if you're gonna eat it raw, which is what this is, I prefer the jarred Italian tuna. This is packed in oil, you drain the tuna, and then you add the tuna to the bean and the onion. And you'll also notice in, in the jarred tuna, it sort of comes in big chunks like this. That pretty darn good. Yeah, a little chunky in there, and that is perfect. Then, a tablespoon of red wine vinegar. Then you take a cup, no, a quarter cup of good olive oil. Now, what does it mean when they say good olive oil? Well, of course that's relevant to what you think is good and what isn't good. My thinking around this is, if you're going to eat oil that is not cooked in any way, you wanna go for a, a extra virgin, cold press, a more robust flavor. If you're gonna cook with it, I would go for a not as expensive, maybe a little lower end, and because I don't think it makes as much difference. But for salads or anytime it's raw, I think this kind of olive oil, this kind of robust, extra virgin, cold press olive oil is worth the money. And the deal with this is you just drizzle it. Just to mix it enough. Then, you know, the old salt and pepper taste, if you've watched the last time we did Taste of New York, uh, of York, you know that, that that's very relative to me. I always say, put a little salt in, 
Put a little less pepper in than you did salt. Because you can always adjust it by adding more. You can't take it out once it's in there. There you go. And you know what? That is the bean tuna dip. Good use of those beans that are in your pantry. Good use of tuna that I bet's in your pantry. Another shout out to Tony Miola for helping uh, providing this recipe for us today. Now, the other thing about this recipe is it kind of makes a lot. And I know a lot of us are not cooking for a lot of people these days, but the good news about this recipe is it keeps for easily a week in the fridge. Maybe longer, although I bet you're gonna like it so much you're not gonna make it uh, last that long. I like the color on my plate. So I'm gonna just put a little pepper right there, add some color. And then chives. Now, I don't know if you're gardening, you guys, but chives are the easiest thing to grow. I use them all the time, and they come back every year. So I'm a big advocate of chives. Now, this is really nice when it's served with a little toast. I made a crostini there, or some crackers. It's great for dipping. Now, the secret here, or another big idea, take the same ingredients. Don't put it in the Cuisinart. Chop the onions, put them in a bowl. Then add the beans, the tuna, the extra virgin olive oil, and the tablespoon of red wine vinegar, and you make a salad instead of a dip. Same recipe, same stuff, really good. Here I'm serving it with um, some lettuce, again the peppers, some cherry tomatoes, some cucumbers in this, and you know, I'm a nut for having color on the plate. One of my secret weapons for this is shaved, peeled carrots. Just take the peeler and you add color to your plate. So there it is, Tuscan white bean tuna dip and salad, same recipe, stuff from your pantry. You're gonna be glad you have it around because people really like to eat it. And that's that recipe for me today. We're gonna to go on to a couple more great cooks. Now, the great thing about what's coming up next in the program is that both of the dishes could either be a first course or an entree, depending on how much you make and all of that. The very next thing you're gonna hear though is from our friends in Maplewood, New Jersey, and they're gonna make fish tacos. And two of my favorite things about how they do this preparation is it, it's a waste not, want not recipe. You don't waste anything. You know that little bit of cheese you have in the refrigerator or a little leftover salsa or a piece of vegetable here or a vegetable there? Any of that stuff is game in this fish taco recipe, which I think is a really good use of leftovers and what's in the refrigerator. And one of the other things that I think is really cool about the recipe is that they take cauliflower and they grate it, and it's a substitute for rice. Very clever, and you're about to see it next. Okay, so from our kitchen in Miller Place to the kitchen in Maplewood, New Jersey, here's the friends of York and the friends of mine. Hi guys, go cooking please. Hi Bill and Jim, you're in our kitchen. Oh, I am Christiane Noll and I'm joined by my wonderful husband, Jamie Lavertier. And Hello. Phil, if he, we've both been veterans of the York Theatre stage and we are thrilled to come join you. Hi York Theatre audiences. Hopefully we will get back to some live theatre, but in the meantime, we are cooking some fish tacos. So we are heating up our pan because it's very important to have the pan be the right temperature. What do you have in it so far? Uh, I just kind of put a little bit of olive oil in there, but I'm going to mess it up really, really quickly. What is in your left hand? Yeah, please? it's not a kind of, we're not vegans in this house because this is bacon fat. Yes, makes everything much better. So now that we got the oils going, what's oils next? Are going. We've got just whatever leftover onions we have in the fridge. So we have a little red onion, we have a little sweet white onion. I did not chop it into tiny little pieces. I wanted it kind of slivery and slith slithery. And 
and that's going to cook down and get all nice and sort of translucent and mushy eventually. And we also have about 1,800 cloves of garlic because just like the bacon fat, you can't have too much bacon fat or garlic in anything. Sorry, vegan people. Yummers. Yeah, so that's already smelling delicious. And we're going to add, I you don't... all of that. That this, looks like cheddar cheese. It is. Wouldn't that be good? No. This is what was left of a head of cauliflower, and I cook with everything. Um, the stems, the leaves, I chop it all up. It's all edible. We don't waste anything here. And how did you prep that, Christina? I shaved it um, on a grater, and then the pieces that kind of fell out, I just kind of chopped into little tiny pieces. We're going to cook those first because the big stuff, these, this very fine rice thing is going to break down really quickly. Those are all the florets that you yes. shaved up? Yes. Yeah. While cool. they were still connected. Um, the, it's important to salt and season while you go. Yeah. So we got some salt. We got some pepper. Oh, it already smells good in here. <laughs> mm. Garlic. Yeah, I always had a, I, the granulated garlic just because, you know, when 1,800 cloves aren't enough, then you have to add more. Um, ground cumin. We need more cumin. Put it on the list. I should have put it on the list. Yep, I gotta save that for fish. All right. Um, I'm gonna save that for later. Ooh, can you smell that? Ooh, everything's opening up. That's wonderful. So we already got some pretty color in there. So now we're gonna add the cauliflower. And this is in place of the rice. This is in place of rice. Cool. Okay, so this, there we go, black beans in there, and it all starts mixing together and looks really, really awesome. Black beans and rice. And we have started with onions. Did you put in the um, cilantro stems yet? Oh, that I should have done. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. That was supposed to toast with the herbs. Oh, well, it's going in. See? <laughs> so what is your acid of choice? We can't see it in the your The acid hand. of choice today is a lime. Mm. And this is the coolest little gadget. It's just a wood thing. But you, you get all of your brush in there. <laughs> For my um, secret ingredient, though. Oh, yes. Do tell. <gasps> Coconut milk. This is not a low calorie dish. We add a little bit of this to make it kind of creamy. Just a, just a bit of it. Ooh, there we go. Now, what is this fish? Oh, good question. It is a maki that is a nice, solid, uh, it's not overly fishy, it's not overly flaky, but it, it uh, has a good consistency for fish tacos, because um, it stands up. It's not like a swordfish, but it doesn't get all, all uh, it just it holds on nicely. So you seasoned one side on the plate, and then you put that pre-seasoned side down. I did. And that. now you're seasoning the other side. That's what you meant was I'll do the other side in the pan. That's exactly what I meant. Mm -hmm. Aha! Here. And look at that! Oh! Oh, prettiness! I'll get out of your way until you put the second one. And I got a little bit of stuff here. There we go. Aha! Oh. Yeah, goodness. that's good, right? But that is nicely browned. Look at that. Yeah, it's going to be good. Here, you want to taste? Not really. This piece, the crunchy piece, is the best piece. Yeah, she's going to, she's going to... Salt, cumin, garlic, Salt, cumin, garlic pepper. 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 Done. Easy. Both sides, little oil in the pan. So good. 
and we are now joined with uh, daughter dearest. This is Rihanna. Hello. Yeah, and she likes to help us in the kitchen sometimes. We are gonna um, heat up the tortillas. So give it a flippy flip. There you go. Oh, now what? Now, while Yummy that's looking. heated, then I like to kind of put chills. Just, not a lot, just a little. Some chills. And then it'll, and then it'll Is that chills. what you're saying? Yeah, chills. Middle schooler? Chills. <laughs> With fish. Some people would say cheese and fish. Oh, but it's so good. Oh, but yes. In this, in this thing. So it's just it's melting really right in the middle there. Yeah, the see cheese. how it's melting? So we're getting ready for our assembly line now. We've got tortillas going with cheese in the middle. We've got our fish ready to cut up, and we've got our I think uh, pseudo rice ready. and beans. We're gonna turn and that down. I'm coming over that. here to our reds and greens station, what? We've got uh, pickles and red peppers and cilantro and cabbage and green onions. And my wife likes to put a little radish sometimes. She's the only one. And under, oh, there's my finger. And under here. <laughs> We have avocado, no yum. There. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So now what are you doing? I am going to get a little bit of fish for our fish tacos. That's mm -hmm. actually a lot of fish, but I'm hungry. Hey, smile for the camera. They haven't seen your lovely face. Yes. Hello. Yeah. How are you, everybody at the York? Is it too close? It's going to get uh, some, <laughs> some feedback from my shiny pate. So that's our version of uh, dump tacos, I guess, this would be a good thing. <laughs> What's next? What's next? Are you guys going to have a dessert? What do you think? What should they make? I, I, I can't wait to, I can't wait to find hungry. out. Thanks. Thank Thanks you. for coming to our kitchen. Bye. 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 of Closer Than Ever. Well, that was a good one, wasn't it? What a talented family. Here comes Jamie Laverdier. You just saw him cooking, and now you're going to hear him singing. York audience may know Jamie best for he was in Closer Than Ever, but also in Roadside. He was in Monet and also in Rothschild and Sons. Here he is at 54 Below. This is a special treat. 54 Below presentation of The Couch by Jeffrey Thompson and Jeremy Desmond. Here he is, Jamie. I bought a couch from some fancy smanchy shop. Oh, she was chic and so unique and had a comfy pleather top. When I got her home, well, something was out of whack. And dang it, two days later, Sent her back. <laughs> I bought another couch from some hippy dippy shop. Oh, she was modern, sort of odd, a kind of nouveau retro pop. But when I got her home, well, it wasn't meant to be. Dang it, two days later, I 
Alexander Free. And Charlotte said, just buy a fucking couch. And I'm like, look, I mean, a couch is like a 15-year commitment. And she's like, I'm sick of watching TV on those goddamn plastic deck chairs. And I said, fine. And she said, great. And someone threw a plate. And while my search for sofa nirvana lingered on, dang it, two days later, Charlotte's gone. Yeah. yeah that was All great. Right. Well, that was there's wonderful. a talented pair, both in the kitchen and on stage. Wow. Absolutely. Tell us about Closer Than Ever. I know that was a huge success for you guys. Probably the longest running show we've ever had in our theater. It ran for five months. It opened for a um, five-week run and ended up running for five months. Uh, 2008. <laughs> Time flies and crawls by these days. Yes. Um, anyway, and it just took off like gangbusters. It had had a nice run originally down at the Cherry Lane in 1989. And uh, this was a slightly reworked version of it, directed by Richard Malby himself. Richard and David Shire, the composer, were very much involved and very excited by it. And we had this incredible cast. What was odd, what, not odd, what was challenging was we started out with this incredible cast and then two of them had to leave. And then we recast them and like, Three weeks later, two more had to leave. And so it was this incredible lazy Susan, that's probably the wrong term, of incredibly talented- Carousel, people. a carousel. carousel. That's it, carousel. <laughs> carousel Speaking of which, did Jamie talented. cycle into it? Jamie, Jamie got into yeah. it too on that carousel. He was not in it with Christiane because Christiane left to do Chaplin on Broadway. Right. Um, along with Jen Colella. But uh, Jamie came in near the end of the run and was wonderful. There was not one person who came in to, who was not wonderful, which has something to say about the power of the material, but also the what Richard and David mean to the musical theater community. People were so excited to do this show that they had seen or knew from the recording and wanted to be a part of this new version of it. And it just ran and ran and ran and delighted audiences. There's an incredible recording of that as well on the J Records label, uh, which if you don't have in your collection, you should. But anyway, getting back to the food, I think that taco recipe is pretty good. I mean, I, I, I don't know, it, we're, when I grew up, nothing went to waste. In fact, we would have left overnight. There was no such thing as throwing stuff out. There also was no such thing as pushing back like, oh, I don't eat that. And it was like, yeah, we ate what mom and dad put in front of us. Right. And that was just how it was. There was no discussion. But what's great, well, many great things about that recipe is, as I said before, you can use up stuff. I love things like that. Uh, you can use that little bit of cheese in the freezer, or that extra tomato or whatever you have, you can do that. I think that's, I think that's really good. And I think waste not, want not is really worth doing. But I love the family angle of that, the three of them in the kitchen. And Absolutely. we're gonna talk to another family, this time uh, one in front of the camera and one uh, operating the camera. So our next recipe is from our friend, Deborah Walton, and behind the camera is her husband, Sean. And uh, okay, so Deb, Sean, what's cooking? Hey, Jim. Hey, Bill. Hey, I'm Deb Walton. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to A Taste of York. Um, a special hello to our York Theatre audience joining us from home or wherever you may be watching this from. Welcome to my kitchen. Um, I am Deb Walton, as I said, and my husband, Mr. Sean Anthony Hill, is behind the camera and is the special guy filming us today. Hey guys, all right, so what I'm going to do now is share what ingredients are actually in the dish. Like I said, originally it was called a shrimp orzo dish, um, but we're doing it with shrimp and farro instead. No reason, uh, farro just happens to be our grain of choice right now. And here's the orzo, the lovely little box of orzo. Orzo is, it's almost rice-sized pasta. It's wonderful, but again, like I said, 
We're going to use farro today, uh, but everything I do with the farro, you could do with the orzo. Uh, so what I need now, um, I'm going to use two cloves of garlic. I'll chop that up for you. If you're not a garlic chopper, I get um, already pureed garlic sometimes. It's a choice. Uh, let's see, we're also going to use chicken broth. I have found that I'm not the best at seasoning the water beforehand. Some people are excellent at it, but I always find it's never enough salt in it or too much. So what I've discovered is a really lovely shortcut in using chicken broth and my farro or my orzo is completely seasoned all the way through when I'm done. A little bit of olive oil, some red pepper flakes, salt, asparagus, and of course our lovely peeled and deveined shrimp. Okay guys, so the first thing you should start with um, is your farro or your orzo. From here on out, I'm just gonna talk about what I'm making and it's gonna be the farro. So what we do is we open our chicken broth so we're going to fill this to about two-thirds, I think that looks about two-thirds, probably two and a half cups of chicken broth. Then we are going to add our orzo. Um, with orzo, you have to rinse it off first. Um, I'm going to do two cups. Alright guys, so while our farro is cooking, we're going to do the prep for the rest of the dish. I'm going to start with the garlic. Um, I did it! Great. And what I'm going to do now, I'll do it very quickly, but just a few for you. Uh, snap off. You can just keep it down there, look. Um, snap off the ends of the asparagus. Not really certain why we do this other than I don't like the bottoms of them and I think it's just, you know, they've been sitting in the store. Don't know where they've been, but anyway, snap off the bottoms of the asparagus. A lot of times when you do it, when you touch the asparagus, it'll tell you where it needs to snap and there you go. So I will finish doing that and we will keep moving. Okay, gang, so we have let our farro cook uh, about 20 minutes. It takes longer than pasta, and even though some of the grains haven't actually opened up fully yet, it's okay. So it's kind of al dente, if farro can be al dente. Bill, you're gonna have to like fill me in on this because I'm not really certain what kind of grain farro is, but I also know it's not completely cooked at the 18, 20 minute mark, not just quite yet. Um, but that's okay because it's going to continue to cook uh, when we get all the ingredients together. So right now I'm just going to transfer it into another pan. I'm sorry, a bowl. And we'll go from there. Low to medium heat. I am going to use about a tablespoon of olive oil. Or a little more to your liking. Uh, a tablespoon and a half of olive oil. And what I'm going to do now is cook our garlic, or not cook it, actually, just kind of saute it. We're going to saute it until it becomes fragrant, not brown. And I'm going to add about a half a teaspoon of red pepper flakes. Um, Sean and I actually like it a little spicier, but just going to put that in there. If you start with that, that's a good starting point for um, heat, um, spiciness, and what we I, what we will do, like I said, is as we cook the dish and as we finish it off, you can add more red pepper flakes if you feel like. Maybe after tasting it, you need it a little more spicy or whatever, but I'll give you the actual rules to start with. So here we are, 
we are sauteing our garlic and red pepper flakes together. And next we will add our asparagus. I want you to know at this point, I actually stole this dish from my cameraman. Um, he is a wonderful gentleman who uh, I married. And um, being out on the road and traveling so much, it's not often that I, as a performer, cook a lot. So it's really incredible that I married a husband uh, who does cook and shares wonderful recipes with me. So I am actually um, stealing this recipe from him and sharing it happily with our York audience today. Um, because it is a one-pot wonder. You ship everything over to the side. Your um, asparagus, uh, your red pepper flakes, the garlic, move it all over to the side. And you add your shrimp now. I'm going to use my hands. I have been washing them the whole time. So I'm going to add the shrimp. And evenly put them on. And it's about a pound of shrimp or a pound and a half. I think Sean and I use a pound and a half of shrimp. Um, again, depending if you're cooking for one, if you're cooking for a family, adjust it as need be. Um, but the initial recipe, a pound and a half of shrimp, I think, and we will cook these um, until they become pink. So now we are going to add in my lovely farro or orzo. And we are going to mix it all in together. And remember, your grain might be a little al dente, whether it be the pasta or the farro, and that's okay because we're still finishing the cooking process as we do this. We're gonna top this off with some feta. I'm using um, just a regular store brand. Um, it also is a Medita Mediterranean herb brand. And you are in the home stretch, ladies and gentlemen, of your shrimp farro one pot wonder. All right, Storyville, love it. it. That was wonderful. And of course, uh, Storyville is just one of a number of shows that Deb Walton has done for us over the years. Um, Conrack and Don't Bother Me, I Can't Cope and various readings and special events. She's just one of those people you can call and say, we've got this project, are you available? And you know that she will deliver and have fun, have you have fun doing it. She's one of those people you love to work with. She started calling herself the bad penny because she always turned up in things at York and we couldn't be happier that uh, she feels that way about us. And I think the feeling's mutual. So thank you, Deb. Thank you, Sean, for uh, maybe you were even talked into this. <laughs> he, uh, I think she volunteered him. So I think that's how that went. 
Oh, oh, okay. Um, we had a great time working on Storyville. I mean, it was an amazing experience. It was my first time working with Deb and I thought uh, just a remarkable contributor. And, you know, since the show was in major flux, although it had been around for a long time, there was a major rewrite going on and you know, they were rolling with the punches, the entire cast. And, you know, it's that spirit that really, it makes it to the stage that givingness, that generosity. And, and I'll tell you, Jim, uh, all of us feel that way about working at the York. It's, it's about making the work and about the environment you and the staff provide for us and encourages us to be our best selves and, and to be, uh, you have more than one bad penny, I'll tell you. We'll show up whenever you ask us to. Thank you. The story Thank you. was written by Mildred Caden, who was a good friend of ours. Yeah, and, very uh, good, dear friend. Yeah, great friend. Um, and, uh, and but, but as you mentioned, the show had a long history and yeah. it had always been close to being wonderful in various productions across the country for 35 years, I think. And uh, together, um, working with Mildred, we really made it into something that got a lot of attention. And it was wonderful that it, it, um, it, it came together in that way. And she was so happy. She and Ed were both there on opening night. Yeah, that's and right. There's a picture of her taking the curtain call with the cast, which to me just that picture symbolizes the word joy. Friends of York, friends of mine, uh, colleagues of mine uh, are going to cook us up something for Puerto Rico. Uh, stage manager Arthur Atkins, who has worked for us a lot and worked with me outside of York, and his spouse. Lisa Regal, who is also a fine actor. These two are quite the pair in the kitchen. Believe me, I know. I have had dinner at their apartment and they are fierce. And uh, here comes something sweet from Arthur and Lisa. Hey, you guys, what's cooking? Hello, Bill. Hello, Jim. And hello, York Theater audience. It's great to be a part of Taste of York, sharing a bit of our New York kitchen with you. Thank you so much for inviting us into your homes. I am Arthur Atkinson. And this is my wife, Lisa Regal. Hi. And today we're making a wonderfully simple dessert, a tembleque, which is a Puerto Rican coconut custard. We found this recipe when we had a half a cup of coconut milk left over from something else. And we don't like to waste things, so we went onto the internet, started looking for what we could do. And from that circumstance, we ended up with one of our favorites. It's very simple, it's very good, so let's get started. So you're going to start with a saucepan, and into that you want to put a quarter cup of granulated sugar, three tablespoons of cornstarch, a pinch of salt, and a pinch of ground cinnamon. Then I'm going to move aside so you can see that Arthur is going to whisk in our can of coconut milk. We happen to be using reduced fat, but you can use regular if you like. It's up to you. He is going to continue to whisk this for five to 10 minutes over medium heat until it starts to thicken and there are no lumps left. And once he feels confident that it's a nice thickness and it's very smooth, he's gonna take it off the heat. It's been 10 minutes and our custard has thickened appropriately. So you'll want to remove it from the heat and let it cool slightly. At this point, you'll add a quarter teaspoon of vanilla extract and about an eighth of a teaspoon, just a shot of coconut extract. If you don't have coconut extract on hand, that's okay. It just gives the dessert a little extra flavor boost that you do. Now, after that's mixed properly, you'll want to pour it into four half cup ramekins. Now, the good thing about this recipe is it's easy to adapt. You can add different extracts or possibly some lime zest or lime peel for flavoring into it. Uh, you can double it, you can even triple it depending on who you're entertaining. Now, since we've been social distancing, we've scaled this recipe down for just the two of us, but hopefully soon we can entertain our friends and family, which we love to do and make a large batch for the occasion. So, at this point, you'll want to cover your ramekins with plastic wrap and press it onto the surface of the custard. This will keep it from forming a skin. Then you'll want to chill this dessert in the fridge for at least three hours, preferably overnight, but uh, three hours is will get it the right consistency that you'll want. 
We really like this dessert all year round. In the summertime, it has a nice sort of tropical coconutty flavor. And now that it's getting a little bit cooler out, when we have a bite, kind of makes us feel we've gone back to one of our beach vacations. So now that our tembleki is set, we're gonna finish it off with just a little tap of ground cinnamon and a little sprinkle of toasted coconut. And I'm gonna take a bite and see how we did. And it's delicious. <laughs> this is a simple and impressive dessert that uses ingredients that you probably have on hand. Thank you, Jim, Bill, and the Taste of York for inviting us. We look forward to seeing everyone at the York Theater where, where musicals, musicals come, come to, to life. life in the not too distant future. And now, on with the show. Wow. <laughs> Hey, Arthur and Lisa, that looks good and sweet. I can't wait. Arthur's a great stage manager. We had the joy of working together a number of times at York. We did Cagney, we did Storyville. We also worked outside of York on a bunch of stuff. But getting back to the York family thing, the last show we did there together and the wackiest happened to have a song about food in it. Here's a little bit of Christmas in Hell. It started in a Woolworths back in 1964. Christmas was approaching when a man walked in next door. Why he chose the gift he did, there is no way to tell. But he bought the fruit cake from Hell. He took it to a party, gave it to his cousin, said, His cousin said you shouldn't have Sorry that he did. On Christmas he said dumping on his clueless Hans Michelle. <laughs> and stuck her with the fruitcake from hell. For a year she kept the fruitcake in a dresser. Then mailed it to her college friend Louise. Who sent it to her favorite professor. Who shipped it to her colleague overseas. Wow. But anyway, we're delighted to have all of our contestants, no, our, our participants. <laughs> volunteers, us. Jim. Remember, we all volunteer. Volunteers, <laughs> that's it. Chefs. Uh, Christian Noel and Jamie Laverdier are here. And Rihanna uh, is in the background somewhere. Arthur Atkinson is with us. Where's Lisa? She is, uh, she got pulled into a meeting. Uh, she's doing a real world job, so. Uh... Yeah, she she says she sends her best from the other room. Well, we we accept it, and we totally understand these days that people have jobs. Uh, Lucky for yeah. real is is amazing. It's yes. incredible. Very and great. our our penny herself, Deb Walton. Uh, thank you so much for being a part of this. Is Sean able to join us? Actually, I think he's in the same meeting with Arthur's wife. Uh, <laughs> wait, wait a minute. Are you uh, suspicious in any way? I'm just saying it's COVID. Anything can happen. No, <laughs> it's actually wait working. Also. Just when you think you've seen it all, there's something else to see. <laughs> <laughs> he's in the office, which would be the bedroom working also. He might pop in if I can pull him out um, at the most opportune Listen, we, time. We totally understand. Thank you. <laughs> well, I love putting this together with you guys. This has just been a joy. And thank you for getting volunteered. And I think we made something that might actually pull people away for net from Netflix for a minute. I just There's just a fun. chance. Although I wow. just watched The Octopus Teacher last night and it's amazing. So if you haven't seen it, I, I recommend <laughs> it. Teacher. Yes. Uh, uh, one of the things that's really remarkable about this, and it wasn't really by design as much as it is one of those happy theatrical collisions 
is that this has been a family affair. I mean, I, we always say it's the York family and we wanted to ask people who are in the York family. And, you know, we use the word family in a certain way in the theater, we, but in this case, it's kind of literal that <laughs> we have a lot of family here. And uh, Christiane and Jamie, of course, are married and their daughter, Rihanna, was in on the recipe, which you all saw earlier tonight. And Deb and her husband, Sean was the cameraman, as was my husband, Steve, the cameraman for me. <laughs> and then uh, Lisa is Arthur's wife and the, they get guys made the sweet, sweet part of the thing. So what that leads me to is, did you have family eating together or family cooking together growing up? I mean, you probably had family Thanksgiving and. That, but was family family style eating or did your parents require to be at the table or what meals did you tend to gather around or were you all too busy or uh arthur why don't you start uh, well we grew up um yeah I, I mean as much as i can remember that many years ago um we had family meals and uh it was a lot of fun when I became an adult and I moved off to college that went away but started cooking again um when I met my wife Lisa and we just mm -hmm. discovered we enjoyed cooking together and that developed a new love and so my my modern day uh cooking skills happened uh within the past 20 years yeah so yeah how big was your family uh two older sisters and my mom and my dad yeah and where was that? Where'd you guys? Uh, uh, Daytona Beach, Florida. Oh, oh, so. I didn't know that. Yeah, Jim, you're a Florida boy too, right? I, how long have I known you? And I didn't know you were from Daytona Beach. I'm from Naples. Oh, yeah, I knew that. I, I might have, we might have mentioned it in passing in between like tech rehearsals or something. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Mine's from um, other places. Yeah. How about Christiane and Jamie? I mean, what what was your, I know, I know, Christiane, you were an only child. So that's sort of, might change the the what that means to have a family meal. Uh, yeah, yes, but um, both um, my father's side of the family and my mother's side of the family, I would spend summers in, in both places um, with with the upper generations, and food was always at the center of everything. I know at my father's side, every weekend all of their closest friends and depending on what part of the summer it is, there would be more, but every weekend people would come and either bring food or they would order food and there would, they'd play cards. They would be frying potatoes out on a wood burning stove mm -hmm. that's outside. You know, they, I mean, it's just food was everywhere. Even when my mom first married my, my dad, she would go in and watch his mother cook all of his favorite foods and try to figure out what uh, she, how she, she was doing it, you know, and, but it was always like, well, it's a handful of this and a handful yeah. of that. And, you yeah. know, so, I mean, like you wanted me to write a recipe about what we just did. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't. You should have seen this yeah. when she read yeah. it. I put a recipe, I don't do, I just oh, throw and taste and throw and what's in, just oh, the, the I could sweat. do more. Yeah, and that's, I think that's what I, what has uh, hand, been handed down okay. because the same with my mom and her mom, They're, those are old Southern recipes. My, my dad's side of the family is Pennsylvania Dutch and my mother's side of the family is Southern. So there's a lot of, uh, rich, heavy, yummy, soul, full. Which is where that lard in your recipe came from. <laughs> lard. It was lard. No, well, you it? don't have to use it. <laughs> My family had a very different experience with it. Uh, we actually didn't cook together much when I was young, but we, we almost always ate dinner at the table, uh, all four kids and my parents on either side with a big tall glass of Brady Bunch milk on the table. <laughs> And um, and my dad worked late, so we would often eat, you know, six thirty-seven. And uh, but we almost always ate in, you know, chaos for the rest of the day. But we would sit down and have a very quiet, staid meal, usually involving peas and a baked potato. So, Deb, what about your family? Um, it's so funny to listen to Jamie say, you know, it's chaos all day, and then you'd come together, the four kids at the table, you know. Um, our, I just remember chaos constantly <laughs> and my mother yelling and screaming for us to sit down or come in from playing or whatever. And I, I do remember 
sitting down and I do remember my three siblings and I at a table, my dad also worked late. So we were, it wasn't really until holidays that we had the full sit down and everybody's around. And, um, and that was just an amazing time with the smells. And that's like one of my favorite smells, you know, on the internet, they'll say, somebody will send you some survey of what's your favorite color? What's your favorite this? And one of my favorite smells is my mother's kitchen during the holiday. So Jamie and Christiane, I've seen you guys on stage together and in stuff. In and the then in Closer Than Ever, it was interesting that you sort of rotated out. You, you missed each other, though you were both in it at York, that big old hit that they had. Um, what's it like working together? I'm sure, it pro I'm going to just put words in your mouth. I'm sure it's pretty great going to work together. It's pretty great given you have a young daughter that you know your schedules sync up. But it, um, it is something we look for, actually. Um, we were supposed to do a little shop of horrors together, but then Julie Andrews um, called and, and I couldn't do it. Either. She didn't call me. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I went out to Colorado by my. my oh, I remember family. that. Yeah. yeah. But we met doing a show. We met uh, touring uh, America with you in town and, and made mm -hmm. that work somehow. So, uh, yeah, uh, we, we just keep getting better at it. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I'm sure it's a dynamic. Arthur, I know you had acting days in your past and you have, and have you and Lisa acted together or? Only you... where we met and in, in our little summer stock theater up in New Hampshire is where we met and we acted together and um, we kind of fell in love and uh, we've never worked together ever since. <laughs> <laughs> that, except in the kitchen. Yes. Yes. And, right. and my question for you is, because we showed the clip tonight, as you know, of you in Storyville soaking wet. <laughs> you said that was okay. You even it's said awesome. that. <laughs> it's really <laughs> awesome. It's really awesome. <laughs> I've been, you know, I, I worked on that show too. And yes, uh, you did. I don't know how you got, <laughs> how were, you, were you really wet? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't yeah. like fake. Wow. It was not fake water. It wasn't it. And I, I became more and more drenched as we went on because they figured we, we got the timing down at first. They, they would just squirt me with a little like mist. And I was like, Oh, I fell into the river and I come out and I wasn't really wet. And my hair was all, you know, still pretty quaffed. And I don't know, I think it was you, Bill, who was like, she needs to look like she's wet. And then by the time I'm, we finished, I may have had something to do with that. You may have. <laughs> I said, I don't believe she's falling in the river. Is that the bucket brigade the you volunteered us for that day? <laughs> Did you have a second wig for that? So there was a wet wig and a not wet wig? I think there was. I think there was. I believe, that, that, I believe that's true. I think there were two wigs backstage. Well, you were, you were on that show too, weren't yeah, you? Yeah, I was backstage. Yeah. I had the towels you're, backstage ready for her. backstage. Me, yeah. 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 <laughs> But well, at one point, it just felt like there were just buckets of water thrown on me and I'd run out and <laughs> do what you got to do. <laughs> Talk about fearless, right? You know, you guys, we could probably yak all night because um, because we miss each other and this, yeah. this community is just so valuable to our spirits as we try to, you know, chin up and mask on kind of through all of this. Food is a four-letter word. <laughs> Love is a four-letter word. But today's favorite four-letter word is vote. Ah, <laughs> oh, there we go. Beautifully put. Oh. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Bill. And, and an incredible amount of thanks to you for pulling this all together. But all of you for all of you, all you've done and brought to this, and all you have done and brought to the York stage. Uh, thank you very much to our audience. Thank you so much. Uh, the entire York staff in one way or another made this presentation possible. People to um, uh, single out, uh, Ryan Klink, our marketing director, um, uh, Philip Karuba, our press representative of many years, uh, uh, Fiona Sweeney, the newest member of our staff, uh, who is behind the scenes recording as we speak. Matt Gurren, our uh, videographer, who edits things together and makes them look wonderful. All of these people and many more contributed to pulling this evening together and we are grateful to them. We're grateful to you, our audience, for supporting us through these difficult times, 
Keep in mind, um, a donation of any size is tax deductible and means a lot to us in these days. So if you care to do so, we would appreciate it. If not, we are delighted to have given you something to uh, enjoy tonight and perhaps to uh, cook for yourselves after the show is over. So thank you for being with us. And uh, now here again is Dennis Cordell to sign us off in a musical fashion. Dennis? Well, that's our show, but don't you worry. Hey, come back soon and bring your spork. We'll take a new taste of your